Welcome to another program in our series on Free Thinking Forum. Uh, I have with me another free thinker, <laughs> Phil Lund. Thank you, Phil, for joining us today. My pleasure, Bill. And uh, we, we've talked about your work as a spiritual director, and uh, there's another facet of your life uh, that you built upon your uh, earning the Masters of Divinity from the Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago, mm -hmm. as well as the Certificate in Interspiritual Counseling from One Spirit Learning Alliance in New York City. Uh, what is a Congregational Life <laughs> Consultant? That's a good question. You, you, you do that for Mid-America Region? For the Mid-America Region. Unitarian Universalist Association. That's right. I, um, sometimes I joke that the uh, Congregational Life Consultant uh, sounds like we're selling insurance. Oh, you know, you know, uh, oh life insurance, the of whole, course. whole, yeah, Congregational Life <laughs> Consulting or Universal Congregational Life Consulting. But actually, um, in our association, congregations are independent. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're, they're little organizations that actually have a lot of uh, work to do. And um, it's hard to do it on your own. So we're the groups that uh, provide resources, oftentimes come and visit face to face, uh, do things, uh, video conferences, uh, video courses, we classes, webinars, webinars. Yeah. Uh, we try to offer all those things, um, build around certain areas, you know, there's uh, leadership development, mm -hmm. um, religious education for children, youth, families, adults, and as uh, I mentioned, the spiritual direction work I've, I've been doing is, is influencing my work with adults in um, religious education. So. Uh, that's one of the areas. Um, stewardship, uh, what it means to give and, uh, you know, what you and can... And give gratefully. And give gratefully and, and what, what you can do with what you receive. And generously. And generously. And mission and vision work. Why is this congregation in this community? What does it mean to be a congregation in this community? And what can you do to make your community a bigger, better place? Mm -hmm. um, growth still, a lot of... Congregations are concerned about growth. The trends in the United States and the religious landscape, as you know, um, congregational attendance, worship attendance, congregational membership has been declining across the board. And, well, uh, not quite. Not quite. W where I go. Well, sure. yeah, that's, see, yes, correct. There are individual congregations. First Unitarian Society there of are, Minneapolis is growing yep. very rapidly. And that's where we can learn from each other. You know, as Congregational Life Consultants, we want to know what's working in congregations that are growing, congregations that are doing good social justice work in their communities, you know. So mm -hmm. it's partially, it's networking as well. You know, we try to connect congregations and groups where they can learn from each other. There's a great experiment going on right now uh, coming out of another region of the UUA, the Central East region. They're doing a flipped leadership school kind of thing. Flipped leadership? Flipped. Oh, yes. boy. I know. Sounds exciting. Do, um, who wants a flipped leadership? Well, you know, this is the way it works. <laughs> leadership schools generally are like one long week in the summer. And, you know, people come and spend that whole week from congregations and learn about organizational development and learning styles and worship. And they, um, you know, it's pretty intensive. Mm -hmm. But it's not for everybody. Not everybody can take a week off. Not, not everybody can afford that cost of a week-long leadership school. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my colleagues, actually, Renee Rehutsky, uh in uh, Ohio has developed this leadership school program where congregations in a group, uh, we have a group in Indianapolis that's doing this right now, Indianapolis, mm -hmm. Indiana, um, they will sign up for it and they will watch videos about certain leadership um, educational things and then come together for one day every two or three months and continue their learning face to face together. But the flipped part is they do their original learning experience using online webinars, videos, conferences, things like that before they do their face to face thing. Oh. And the price difference is amazing because this yeah. is like you can do it all for $50. 
Wow. I know. <laughs> so, but Versus that, thousands. Right, right. And, you know, it's a matter, you know, how we, how we do things together as congregations and denominations and middle judicatories. That's technically what the Mid-America region is. Middle judicatory. And those are one of my favorite, favorite <laughs> phrases, middle <laughs> judicatory. But, you know, how we all work together is changing. A yeah. lot. Oh, yeah. And technology is helping it a lot. It sure that is. Um, like, for example, um, these programs, once upon a Well, well and, and, and these the, things. Yeah, yes, and your, your <laughs> tablets and your pads and your, your phones. But once upon a time, this kind of program would only be shown on cable. Yeah. You, and you that, mentioned it's on YouTube now. Right. This is on YouTube. Right. So you have all of these learning opportunities that are available using web technology and digital media. So. I'm just kind of excited that this work is changing the way it is, but we can still connect people. We can still do face-to-face -face things when needed, and we can also meet online when needed, and we can also, you know, learn from each other laterally more than, you know, yeah. vertically. So. Well, uh, I mentioned I'm a member of First Unitarian Society, mm -hmm. but I'm also a member of a fledgling group mm -hmm. in Buffalo, Minnesota, mm -hmm. the Buffalo Unitarian Universal Fellowship. And the they have not grown big enough mm -hmm. to be a uh, full-fledged fellowship mm -hmm. yet. But now the uh, tell us about this Unitarian Universal uh, board decision yes. that yes. allows for communities, yeah. recognized communities. Recognized communities, right. Yeah, that was one of the things we wanted to talk about. What are these changes? And one of them is uh, there, there have been groups of people meeting, Unitarian Universalists meeting, um, in ways that don't really fit the mold of a traditional congregation. Like what? Well, some places there are actually young adults who are living together in housing together, mm -hmm. forming a, an intentional community, they call it. And it's an intentional They don't use community. the word commune? No, nope, they don't use the word because commune. Because it's not really a commune. It's not really a commune, yeah. It's a, it's a little different. Um, Intentional community. Community. And it's happening in other religious groups and denominations, too. But, yeah, you, young adults living together, um, trying to live up to the, 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 the best that their faith can off offer. So we have Unitarian Universalists living together in cooperatives in mm -hmm. housing situations, but they're never going to be a congregation. They're not open like a congregation is to invite anybody in to come because they're living there. Yeah. Um, yet they want to be recognized somehow. So that was one of the, that was one so of the kinds of groups. But do you have to live together? To no, 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 no. Because there are other groups meeting too. I, I know about your Buffalo group meeting on Wednesday night. Yeah. You know, that, you know, and we have people coming from that are members of other congregations yep yeah. yeah, it's great and it's not a typical you know ch when people think of church they think of sunday morning but you know wednesday night i i hear you're going to be meeting in a bowling alley right yeah well, so, we, so we could bowl before <laughs> we uh, have our assembly <laughs> so i think that's great and but it would really hard, be hard to present this wednesday night in a bowling alley as a traditional church you're, you're something right now it's something new even though you've been meeting well, for a while. we will be dining uh, uh, some of us, at yeah. least, before we uh, uh, meet, have our official, what, growth meeting, yes. I'd, I'd call it, growth time. And I would call the dining table fellowship. Yes. Yes, right. So there you go. So that's a different, and there are lots of groups like that. And I think I mentioned to um, some members of the Buffalo group that there was a group in um, Lenexa, Kansas. It was uh, pretty much retired folk. Yeah. And they were meeting on Sunday evenings in a library. Mm -hmm. And it was more of a friendship circle than anything else. And they had managed to be uh, officially recognized as a congregation, but they really weren't. And they eventually disbanded because there was really no category to say, you know, this is who you are. Yeah, they couldn't live up to being a fellowship. They, no. Uh, but the community is a different... Yeah. And they... They still contribute to the UUA. They yep. still get services from the UUA. Yep. But um, what? How? What? What are some of the other examples? Well, um, the big ones really are those ho the the housing groups living together, and people I think meeting on different days, non-traditional days or times, 
Um, and groups under 30, really, or even groups smaller than that. Now, I could also see... Well, I, I see on uh, meetup. That's what I was going to just say, yeah. meetup groups. Yeah. See, a meetup group, if it became... Well, meetup, we should tell folks, meetup is a, uh, an online um, platform that groups can use, but they have to promise to meet face-to-face. So you, you have shared interests around something, but uh, when you set up your meetup group, you say, we are going to meet on Saturday morning or Wednesday afternoon every week or every two weeks or once a month or whatever it is. So yes, that would be a perfect example. Somebody start a Unitarian Universalist meetup group, five, six, ten people meet. It becomes sort of a regular thing, um, mm -hmm. but it's not going to, they're not trying to be a church. They're, mm -hmm. they're just people who have a shared interest in something meeting. And now they can be a... Now they can be recognized. A recognized community yeah. by the UUA. Yeah. So thank you. I was just about to say meet up when you said it. So <laughs> you know, thinking alike there, right? Yes. <laughs> well, the, the fellowship in, in Buffalo has a meet up membership. And, the, uh, and not only for the Wednesday evening meeting, but for the Buffalo Gals. Well, what is the bu what, what the are Buffalo the Gals meet on okay. uh, Thursday lunch? Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, from time to time. Yeah, our group, one of our groups in Indianapolis, um, does rather than doing what we used to do with campus ministry, which was try to have one person, you know, come to the campus and try to gather students, um, they have meetup groups now that the church sponsors, and they're mm -hmm. mainly around lunch. But, you know, they promote it as, you know, if you're a Unitarian Universalist or a free thinker or, you know, a religious mm -hmm. progressive or spiritual but not religious or just somebody who wants to check it out, we meet Tuesdays yeah. at a certain place at, at lunch. Yeah. And so it's actually outreach for them using this meetup stuff. But one of those groups could end up being a recognized community. You know, I'm thinking about putting this on Roku and Apple TV mm -hmm. and... What is it? Chromecast. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that people realize this tremendous opportunity they have now yeah. to uh, discover mm -hmm. uh, a way of being together with the support of staff like you. Right. Right. No. Um, and we have a staff person at the UUA headquarters in Boston who helps us out with this, too. So it's, mm. it's something that the board of directors of the UUA are very interested in seeing happen, that more groups get a recognized officially yeah. without having to do all the steps to become a congregation. But you, you do work with large and small congregations. Yes, yes I do. Uh, um, yeah. What, what, what do you find most interesting uh, in your work now? Well, now. It, it's just a matter of helping them not go out of business? <laughs> uh, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, that, that, that uh, flipped leadership school thing yeah. I talked about, that's a way for, for us to bring resources to groups that may not have, could afford them before. Um, maybe they thought they were too small mm -hmm. to, for it to be of use, but actually those are resources for all sorts of sizes. So what I'm doing now is I'm looking at the various groups we have around this region and saying, well, here are some congregations that my, may have been underserved by us mm -hmm. in the past because of limited resources, um, time, travel, um, expenses. So can we offer them this, and this would increase their leadership skills and abilities, which could possibly keep them from, you know, losing Thinking. membership and declining. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, you know, there, like you said, you wanted to put this on R Roku and Chromecast and everything. Just let people know about the possibilities, and that's kind of... Uh, what we can do now, because I think these possibilities um, do offer the chance of, uh, of a small group thriving rather we, than diminishing. We don't have to buy commercial time on no, broadcast no, no. to get our word out yeah. as, as freely as we... So I'm looking at, for another one of these leadership school things, um, Fargo, Grand Forks, Bismarck, mm. North Dakota, um, you know... The itinerant, <laughs> not itinerant. You're but, not. Yeah, but, you're not just randomly going about. You're no, responding. no. We're looking. Yeah, we're looking at places that are doing well, but are in and, and communities that are actually economically doing well, and there's a lot of potential for them. Now, yeah. You know, and not to forget the small ones either. I'm going down to Okaboji, Iowa, in a 
mm -hmm. in March, and that's a new group that's just officially affiliated because they managed to have enough members and they, they meet regularly on Sunday morning and they become a congregation. Well, that, isn't that, that's a vacation area, isn't it? It is. They're, they're, they're in, they, they flip a little something. They have more people there in the summer right. than the, the rest of the year. So they gear their programming to really be up and running full tilt during the summertime. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I generally visit them in February. <laughs> it's a little colder <laughs> and downtime. icier. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I'm going to Evansville, Indiana. Yeah, uh, that's a big congregation, isn't it? It's it's not. Yeah, it's it's an okay size one. It's mm -hmm. they've been around for a while, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. One of the things that has happened when our district, the Prairie Star District, merged with two other districts, the Central Midwest and the Heartland District. Yep. The area that we cover is much larger. All the way from Kansas? Yeah, well, actually, I like to measure it like from Rapid City. South Dakota? South Dakota to Lexington, Kentucky. Mm. It's a pretty, and Michigan well, down to. Isn't the rest of Kentucky included? Yes, but I think Lexington is like the furthest distance we can oh. get. You know, it's pretty far. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few other groups in, in um, Kentucky, that's for sure. And some new groups, too. And some groups that um, can be recognized communities. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we've got about 12 minutes left, and I, I want to make this very okay. valuable to sure. the viewers. So what, what more should we talk about? What's the latest news from the UUA? Okay. Have, we, have we covered it all? No, no, no. There's a lot going on with the UUA. I think some big picture things that are interesting are, um, one, at our General Assembly, which happens every year. In June. In June, end of June. It's going to be in Portland, Oregon this year. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, what dates? Uh, it's around the 22nd, 23rd, 20, you know, it's yeah. that uh, Wednesday through Sunday around those, yeah. around that time. Um, they've been experimenting with off-site voting at General Assembly. Oh, and, and Oregon is a champion of off-site oh, voting. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there you go. It's a perfect place. Yeah. Um, but, you know, up until recently, in order for a congregation to have delegates vote, they had to go and physically be mm -hmm. at the site of General Assembly. And ministers get a vote, but they would have to go and physically be there. Oh. Now they're going to, they've been experimenting with doing voting where people can be off-site as delegates and vote on all the bylaw changes and whatever, it, the nominees for various committees, and they can vote off-site now to do that. Really? Which will change, I think, that the whole kind of tone and possibility of what can happen with General Assembly. Can they, can they speak up? Um, I believe there is a way for people to communicate, you know, um, to... By Pro, text, con, text? speak, text. Could be tweeting on their Twitter <laughs> or texting or sending a message, but yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, so... So it, it could become a really continent-wide group. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was one thing when Unitarians were like, you know, mostly around Boston getting together once a year, but when we're spread out all over the place, and again with budgets and travel expenses and things like mm -hmm. that, just making it easier for people to participate in the democratic process, which as you know is one of the principles. Uh, uh, key principle, yes. Of Unitarian Universalism. Yes. We the people will control things. And to, to have that distance voting option. Mm -hmm. So we do that also on the regional level. Oh. Or we're trying to. Yeah. We you're, have a regional assembly. We're having one gathering this year in yeah, Naperville. Yeah, Naperville, Illinois. But, but, but still people can vote without I believe so, there? yeah. 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 And, but uh, two years ago, or last year, we had four sites. I remember that. Yeah, and people could vote from those various sites. So that's kind of in between, you know, off-site mm -hmm. voting and so, but we're, you know, we're working on that too. And actually we've been in touch with the people at the UUA on how they do their voting process, Good. which is pretty complicated as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, so. To know that somebody's qualified yeah, to vote. Yeah, and to make sure all the technology's working. And, you know, if you're gonna promise something that you're gonna be able to vote, you wanna be make mm -hmm. sure that it can happen. Yeah. Um, so there's that news. Well, I suggest cons consulting our Minnesota State Secretary of State that just finished his term. All right. About voting. Uh, yes, a fellow Unitarian Universalist, Mar Mark Ritchie, yeah. who 
uh, made it, well, he made it through two big statewide recounts. Oh, yes, yes. In a, in a way that made it very clear we, we've got fair voting Integrity, here. Integrity, yes. Integrity. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. And uh, it, it, it helped us avoid the voter suppression mm -hmm. that move. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, photo ID, ID. Photo ID, yeah. 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 That's a good point. So Mark, call. Mark's an expert on okay. that. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, you, that is right. You want, you want people to know that the, there's integrity in the process. Right. Definitely. And, and that's why they've been doing it slowly at the UUA level and why we're being very careful about how we do it at the regional level. Mm -hmm. We want you know make sure that people know that their vote is getting through and counting. And yeah, there needs to be integrity. Good. But another big change is in the way that the president of the UUA is going to be elected. Oh, what's that? Well, there is a committee that seeks nominations, and um, people can nominate themselves or be nominated by other people. Mm -hmm. And they're going to choose two candidates. Two candidates. Two Not candidates one. to run. Yeah, to run. Uh, so there's a choice, um, and I believe we'll have to check this to make sure that rather than two eight-year terms, it's going to be one six-year term. No. Mm. So the idea is that it's long enough for an individual to make a mark and, on the on the organization and to afford to move. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, and you know, and without having to do the re-election thing yeah. in the middle of the term, which we know can just take up a lot of time and energy. Yeah. So um, so that's another big change. So you know, with this offsite voting at general assembly. Um, the way pres the nominees for presidents are, uh, candidates are nominated, and then their term, it's all going to be changing. So it's Great. kind of exciting. Well, yeah, it, it, that does sound like changes for the better. I think so, overall. I mean, because, you know, our current structure, we, the Unitarians and the Universalists merged in 1961, and I believe they've been doing their annual meetings the same <laughs> way since then. And I believe, you know, they've been doing the two four-year terms for the president the same way yeah. for 50 years, so when half I, a century. Speaking of that, when they merged, I applied to be a minister in the American Unitarian Association. Did you? Did you? And, and I ended up discovering I'm a Unitarian Universalist. Yes. Oh, <laughs> is that what you found out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 I, right in the middle of my process of your, getting, your, your training and your uh, 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 yeah you, it changed on you and uh, I ended up going to a universalist congregation in Rockland Maine did you the lobster capital of the world oh my goodness yes also a great place for summer visitors I believe so like Okaboji yes <laughs> well, I, apparently that's why Unitarians would uh, not meet in the summer, because all the Massachusetts Unitarians would go up to Maine to... Well, I think Unitarians ought to meet the same in the summer. Well, and more and more congregations do. I, I, First Unitarian Society is. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, the uh, ministry used to be, you know, people might think of it as a nine-month-out-of-the-year job, uh, mm -hmm. but not anymore. Not like Church. teaching. Yep, it's like church goes all year long now. And well, it should. Yeah, and, and it, in part because air conditioning is not so much a problem. Right, uh, yeah. Anymore. No, I've been in churches where they meet like in the basement during the summer because well, that's where they do have air conditioning that's, or it's that's cooler. That's for Unitarian Society. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, you know that, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, Community Church in New York, that's what they would do. Oh, they do when, that too. When they meet in the summer, they'd meet down in the instead fellowship of, hall. Instead of uh, cooling that, gigantic yeah, space yeah 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 so you know logistics well it's part budget. of part of conserving energy that's right yeah <laughs> now we've got about four minutes left okay and uh we haven't we we haven't really talked enough i think about the history of the uua yeah yeah uh, well, this this part of the country was had the privilege of some of the first Women ministers, That's as right. I recall. The Iowa Sisterhood is oh, what yeah. they were known uh, as. Uh, my, my congregation in Iowa City benefited yep. from that. Founded by women ministers in the 19th century. And now women are very much a part of 
They are. It was uh, when I was being trained in around 2000, that was when um, the number of congregations being served by women went over 50% really? in the Unitarian Universal Association. Over 50% now. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know we've had a, a woman minister who went on to even even larger congregation. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it, I, I see some important advantages in having both male and female mm -hmm. uh, perspectives yeah, in the well, ministry. Like when we talked about earlier with spiritual direction too, the more perspectives you have on something, the better. Yeah. So actually we've been, um, I've been using, um, this is a kind of mingling of ministers and spiritual direction, but we've been using poetry for what they call Lectio Divina, where you look at a text and you read it slowly and then you respond to the text together and you read it again and respond again. And I've been mm -hmm. doing that with ministers and ministerial students and you're right, the diversity is really important. Yeah. Gender diversity, you know, racial and diversity, economic diversity, right. sexual orientation diversity, just when you get all those views on something, mm -hmm. it's much richer. Yeah, uh, well certainly that was true in, in the chalice groups that I attended. Definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, two women married to each other, mm -hmm. led it, and it was certainly, a, I, I think they did it so well, mm -hmm. right. partly because they really were a team. Right, and that's something you wouldn't have seen, I don't know. In UU churches, you might have seen that five or ten years ago, but you wouldn't have seen that in many other churches at all. At many yeah. other denominations. Many other denominations, yeah. yeah. Um, fortunately, we've made quite a bit of progress there. Yeah. Well, uh, Phil, uh, you, you care to tell us a little more about, uh, tell us about where you grew up and, and how you got started on yeah. this. Did, did you know you were a Unitarian? Right from oh, well that happened to me the way I think it happens to a lot of people. I was um, in college and- uh, Me too. Uh, yeah, so reading Emerson. Yeah. I'm a transcendentalist at heart, so. Hmm. I read Emerson and Thoreau and, and well, uh, I said, uh, wow, if I'm ever going back to church, I think I'm a Unitarian. Yeah, well, I read Emerson on in big letters on the wayside pulpit. Sign. Oh, you saw a big old wayside uh, pulpit outside the First Unitarian uh, Church of Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. But oh, this has been great to have yeah, you, Phil. It's been good talking and, with you, Bill. And I'm so glad you are a consultant for <laughs> congregational life. That's me. Not selling life insurance. Not selling life insurance. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. <sighs> yeah.